Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Winescape Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Carroll. Today's podcast is one of those long-awaited episodes. People have been asking for this one for a long time. You know, it's funny. Sometimes there are some possible guests who are just so obviously Mindscape guests, and I haven't had them on yet, and people are like, well, what's wrong? Why doesn't he have them on yet? They must be feuding. There must be beef or something like that. That's not usually the correct answer. It's usually just that I like to space them out. I, as I've said many times, like to have a variety, and that includes both both people who I know very well and am familiar with their work and people I've never heard of before I got to looking for podcast guests. So Tim Maudlin is someone I've known for a long time, is a leader in the philosophy of physics or what we sometimes call the foundations of physics. So studying not physics as a philosopher, but studying nature as a philosopher, but doing so in such a way that you're looking at the foundational questions of nature. You're asking the why questions, the deep questions. You're trying to be very careful. And Tim has done very important work in thinking about space-time and the geometry of space-time, the nature of time and the arrow of time. Uh, I will point to, I will try to link in the show notes to a wonderful mock debate that was done at the Foundational Questions Institute between Tim and Julian Barber. Julian Barber famously has advocated that time does not exist. Uh, Tim has famously advocated that not only does time exist, but the arrow of time is fundamental, not just an emergent approximation because of statistical mechanics. And what FUXI does is it has the debaters flip sides. So Julian was arguing in favor of the existence of time. Tim was arguing against it. And they were both really, really good. I, I got to say, they were both quite persuasive for the points of view they didn't actually agree with, as well as being uh, quite amusing along the way. But today, we're actually going to be talking about quantum mechanics. In some sense, this can be thought of as a sequel to the podcast they did a while back with David Albert talking about quantum mechanics. David and Tim uh, are very good friends and have worked together for a long time. They don't agree on everything because no two philosophers agree on everything, but They are united in their skepticism about the Everett interpretation of quantum mechanics. And so with David on the podcast, even though I'm pro-Everett, I want to give the voice to uh, sensible voices on the other side, sensible points of view. And so David explained why he doesn't like the Everett interpretation. What we didn't get to, ran out of time, was what he does like. So today with Tim, we're going to be talking mostly about Bohmian or De Broglie-Bohm versions of quantum mechanics, sometimes called hidden variable versions of quantum mechanics. I keep calling them hidden variable theories, as most people do, even though, as advocates like to point out, the variables are not hidden. The extra variables that you add to quantum mechanics to make a hidden variable theory are the ones that you observe when you actually make a measurement. And physicists have not really caught on to hidden variable theories. They're not very popular. Um, but certain sets of people, uh, some physicists, some mathematicians, some philosophers, have kept the flame alive. And interestingly, as we talk about in the podcast, the Nobel Prize last year was given to tests of John Bell famous theorems, his famous inequalities, which were very much prompted, Bell's exploration of these theorems and his proof of them was prompted by David Bohm's hidden variable theory, which Bell thought was the best formulated known version of quantum mechanics. Bell thought we should be teaching it in textbooks. So it's a little weird that uh, the people who really take these theories seriously get good results that later lead to Nobel Prizes, yet The theories themselves are not very popular within physics. Again, I could give my reasons for not being um, a fan of hidden variable theories, but they are, as Tim says about Everett, they are absolutely a serious attempt. You know, it's something that you should think about if you care about these things. And so we'll give the sales pitch for why you should take these seriously. We'll talk a little bit about foundations of physics more generally and even a little bit about the arrow of time. And the other thing that I want to mention, because Tim reminded me of it at the very end of the podcast, is Tim is a uh, the director, and, and I think he's, his title is director, but anyway, he's the founder of something called the John Bell Institute for the Foundations of Physics. Uh, Tim has been very active not only in doing foundations of physics, but in advocating for the status of this subdiscipline within philosophy and physics. And the Bell Institute, which is uh, located in Croatia and serves as a place to meet and talk about foundations of physics, is trying to raise funds to get a permanent home. 
So they literally have a GoFundMe, and you can visit the John Bell Institute homepage at johnbellinstitute.org. That will link you to a donate button. You can donate to the uh, permanent home for the John Bell Institute. Uh, we're, we're not there yet. We need a, b- a bunch more donations, but I think they just started, so it's early days. Maybe Mindscape listeners will kick in a little bit. And with that, let's go. Tim Maudlin, welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. Thank you. Good to be here. So you've been a champion for a little while of something called the Foundations of Physics. So I want to ask you two questions. One is, what is that for the listeners out there? But also, what's your sales pitch? Like, hypothetically, if you're talking to your colleagues in a physics department or a philosophy department, how do you explain to them why foundations of physics is so important? Okay. Um, oddly enough, I don't have to sell it to the, to the philosophers. It's a weird situation. You have to sell it to the physicists. <laughs> um, but it's very simple. Really, foundations of physics, as the name suggests, is a branch of physics, namely the one that asks... What are the most fundamental items? How do we understand the most fundamental physical structures and things that there are? And that's only part of physics because you could do uh, condensed matter physics where you say, I'm just worried about other states or or, uh, the physics of stars. And you take for granted a lot of the micro stuff or at least how to handle it. Uh, and then you're building up from there. But if you just dig and dig and dig and say at the very bottom, what's the stuff that doesn't get explained in terms of other stuff? Yeah. That's the foundations. And so if you do that in physics, that's the foundations of physics. Um, in philosophy, it's easy. I actually just gave a talk about this to the undergraduates at Rutgers because that is part of what philosophers call metaphysics or ontology, mm-hmm. which is, again, just the question of what exists asked at the most generic level. And if you're a physicalist, you think everything that exists is somehow physical. If you're not, you might think there are other things that aren't physical, but everybody pretty much agrees there's some physical stuff. Not and everybody, sadly, not but yes. everybody, of course. All, every time you say something, you can think of a counterexample, unfortunately. Um, now, the curious thing, if I describe it that way, is you say, but why should you have to sell this to the physicists? Why isn't this just part of the physics curriculum. And that has a very strange and disturbing sociological answer that really goes back to quantum mechanics because they didn't really understand when quantum, when the quantum mechanical formalism was first developed in a way that was very predictively successful, they really didn't understand what they were talking about. They, the physicists? They, the physicists, yeah. the, the physicists who came up with the math. Um, And you can come up with math and understand how to manipulate it to get predictions, but still not look at that math and be quite sure what the physics underlying it is. And those were very good questions, and they were asked very rigorously uh, and vociferously early on by people like Einstein, um, people like Schrodinger, people who were very deeply involved even in the development of the theory. Um, But at a certain point, another crew led by Bohr (laughs) and to some extent Heisenberg kind of said, well, don't ask those questions, Um, either because for some deep philosophical reason, they're not good questions, although they sound pretty good, or eventually this morphed into what people call shut up and calculate, where Mm -hmm. you don't even explain, you just say, don't ask those questions. I mean, my impression would have been that Bohr and Heisenberg were more like, we've told you the answer to those questions. And then when the Americans got hold of it, it was like, just don't even ask those questions. (laughs) That's my take on it, was that it was, I mean, Bohr's background was in neo-Kantian philosophy. He actually said very, very, very mysterious things. Um, And I I would say early on, the idea of, of the Copenhagen school was say some incomprehensible stuff and then calculate. And then when it came to America, they cut out the first step. (laughs) Good. And so, but you said sociological reasons. I mean, I can imagine why, well, don't let me imagine. What is, in your opinion, the sociological reason why physicists would stop asking what is going on at the fundamental nature of reality? So, and and I'm speculating here, when, when they first started, everybody's familiar with this 
picture of the atom as a kind of planetary system with a nucleus and then these electrons whizzing about it. We still kind of picture it that way. Uh, and that was sort of what was called the old quantum theory said that. And it said, by the way, these electron orbits are restricted. They can't just orbit any way that, anywhere where a planet can. They're restricted to these particular little orbits. And then all they can do is jump between them. And when they jump between them, they'll either give off or, or, or absorb some light. And there was a bunch of explanation that you could get out of that basic picture. But if you pursue that picture, the natural question is, what, but how do they jump? I mean, what, you know, how does it get from here to there? And, <laughs> and how does it orbit when it's in one of these orbits and questions like that? And they kind of work beavered away at that and couldn't make much progress on it. And I think they eventually got to the point where they, they didn't want to say, yes, those are good questions, which we can't answer. Mm. And they were satisfied that they were calculating correctly. And in order not to say there's really deep questions we don't know the answer to, they said, no, 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 we've got it. We just have the mathematical formalism. The only reason you're puzzled is that you're trying to push some classical picture on the microscopic realm and it doesn't belong there. And your confusion is arising from you <laughs> having um, unjustified desires for comprehension. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I don't know if I've ever mentioned this to you, I have talked to fellow physicists and and I've opined that despite everything I personally care about more than just correctly predicting the outcomes of experiments I actually care <laughs> about talking about reality and many of them are very open and explicit that all they want to do is predict the outcomes of experiments yeah and I think it would it, if somebody had a lot of funding and a lot of time it would be interesting to figure out at what point these people started saying that? Because my experience is that young people going into physics care a lot about trying to understand. And they get very upset. And I know this because I teach foundations of physics in the philosophy department. And I get physics students who say, this is why I went into the field. You're talking about the stuff I was interested in. And I think in most cases, right, I don't, can't imagine, uh, you know, uh, an 18-year-old saying, I just want to calculate, right? <laughs> so I think that basic curiosity about the world gets beaten out of them. Yeah. Um, and I really think it's part of a physics education, unfortunately, to beat it out of you. So we talked about Einstein and Bohr, et cetera, but it's still more or less true, you say? I, that, that's my impression. Yeah. I certainly can testify that lots of physics students will come to me and say, I get very frustrated. I raise questions to my physics professors of the form, what's really going on here? And I'm not told these are good questions, right? I really am told, don't ask them. Don't, don't spend your time thinking about this. And slight generalization, but the philosophers, to their credit, have kept the flame alive. They've been thinking about these things. Yeah, yeah. It's, sort of, you know, it's the same way that Aristotle kind of ha had to be squirreled away in the Islamic world for a while <laughs> and then eventually found his way back. Yeah. Um, you know, I, yes, I do think that, that really philosophy has been a refuge. Um, and in some cases, as you know, like David Albert got his degree in theoretical physics at Rockefeller. His background was not in philosophy, but he's in a philosophy department because these questions were welcomed in philosophy departments and not welcomed in physics departments. Now, my feeling, a lot of people around us, and I have some concrete reason to believe things are getting better. I actually got a, an email kind of out of the blue from a chair of a physics department who said, we're thinking of trying to introduce foundations of physics into our program. Can you give me advice oh about, you know, what we might teach and how it might be done? This was great. And this was somebody I'd never met. Just, you know. I, I was literally just yesterday talking to an undergraduate thinking about grad school, and she wasn't sure. She, she likes the foundations of physics, so but she's a physics undergrad, so she thought it'd be better to go to a physics department for grad mm -hmm. school, was asking for advice on where to go. And I, it was hard for me to even come up with departments who would let you do that right now. Right. But maybe it's changing. Yeah. And, you know, and at a certain time, I guess that you could say, well, you could go here because, yes, it's a normal physics department, but at least one or two people 
on the weekends and a little bit <laughs> hiding from their colleagues are interested right. in these subjects and we'll, we'll talk to you about them if you catch them, you know, off their clock. Um, All right. So there's our sociology, but you already opened up uh, the doors to what we want to talk about, which is these mysteries of quantum mechanics. And David Albert was on the show. Uh, uh, David Wallace was on the show. We were mostly talking about entropy in the arrow of time. Adam Becker gave us his wonderful historical introduction. But when we, we were talking to David Albert, uh, mostly we criticized the Everett interpretation of quantum mechanics. I say we, we being the royal we. <laughs> I was defending it, but I, I, I always let the guest talk. So David gave his spiel. So what, I, what we didn't get time to get into is, okay, then what instead? So if if put it, let's not talk about Everett today sure. unless it unless it comes up. I want to be like uh substantive and proactive and, and and constructive what do we do if we're thinking about what are the what are the mysteries we're trying to solve about quantum mechanics that got us into this trouble and what are the avenues open to solving good so um that's a really good question and there there are several different dimensions to it but let me start with a dimension and i am going to briefly um bring in everett but then let it go Fine. uh Everybody knows there's this experiment, they say a thought experiment, although you could do it, it would be cool to do it, that Schrod Schrodinger talked about um, with this cat penned up in a cage with a, with a bit of uh, radioactive material and a Geiger counter and this diabolical device. Um, actually, that turns out that Schrodinger was really just reconfiguring uh, the same thought experiment that Einstein had written to him just before, which had to do with a keg of, of uh, gunpowder that either would or would not explode in the next half hour. And you could calculate a quantum mechanical probability for it to explode and not explode. And what Schrodinger was pointing out and what, what Einstein was pointing out is that if you hold two views, which are very natural views you would like to hold, you got into what seemed to them to be hopeless difficulties. And the two views were, first of all, when we do quantum mechanics, we describe a system with a thing called a wave function mathematically. One of the questions is, okay, that wave function, does it provide us a complete description of the system? Meaning every physical fact about that system, one way or another, could be extracted if you gave me the wave function. And this was when, when Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen wrote in 1935, and this is the same year as the cat paper. And the cat paper was really a response or a, a reaction is yeah. better to say to the EPR paper. The title of that paper is Quantum Mechanical Description of Reality Complete. This is what they were looking at. And they were arguing in that paper, no, um, there's, more, there's more to the world than wave functions. If that were true, of course, then as a physicist, again, not as a philosopher, but as a physicist, the question is, okay, what else is there? <laughs> Tell yeah. me about the other stuff. So, so there's one question, is the wave function complete? And then there's the question about how the wave function evolves through time, what its dynamics is. And there's a Schrodinger wrote down this wonderful equation that has his name, that has some nice mathematical properties, particularly linearity. And People certainly wanted to say at least part of the dynamics is this Schrodinger evolution. And you might say, well, why not, why not just go whole hog and say all of it is Schrodinger evolution. That's all it ever does. Yep. Okay. I now, like you, that idea. That sounds promising. Yeah. If you, <laughs> so if you put those two together and you say, A, the wave function is complete and B, it always evolves by Schrodinger evolution. Then you get into this problem that Schrodinger was pointing out and that Einstein was pointing out, which is that for the cat or for the gunpowder after an hour, the wave function doesn't tell you either, yes, it has exploded or no, it has not exploded or yes, the cat is dead or no, the cat isn't dead. The, way, the wave function goes into this, we call superposition of different states, which normally you'd associate one state with the exploded gunpowder and another with the unexploded. But what the wave function gives you is not one or the other, but a kind of combination of both. And if you say, well, that's a complete description, there isn't no further fact <laughs> that's left out, then you say, but, but then the cat's neither alive nor dead, or the gunpowder is somehow in you know, a weird suspended state between exploded <laughs> and not exploded. And, you know, Schrodinger's view of that was that that was ridiculous. Um, 
And John Bell, when he writes about this, I mean, the way he sums this up is he says, uh, either the wave function as given by the Schrodinger equation is not everything or it's not correct. And Everett, now I'm just going to say the one thing about yep. Everett is an attempt to say, no, it is both everything and correct. I came up with a way to make it both everything right. and correct. Right. right. So I, I would say that's the route that leads you to the many worlds theory. And I, you understand the motivation. It's to keep both of those nice things. But it has this price to pay in terms of saying, you know, the idea that that one cat you put into the cage, it either ended up alive or dead. No, that's not right. <laughs> they're world, they're right, now, yeah. you know, and, and not just two cats, actually infinitely many yeah. cats. People don't point this out that the there might be only one live cat, but there are going to be a whole lot of dead cats because the thing could have decayed at all these different times. Um, now, if you don't want to go that way, and so we won't spend our time talking mm -hmm. about the price you have to pay and what you have to do. I suppose let's let's just get yeah. our cards on the table for the audience purposes. You're not a fan. I'm not, but it's a serious attempt. I mean, right. you have to be very clear here. There are things I'm not a fan of, but I appreciate the honesty of people who are fans if they see the what they have to confront and they, you know, straightforwardly say, yes, I I by making these commitments, I inherit these problems and I'm gonna work on those, right? And, and nobody should just turn their back, in my view, on a serious proposal. I take it to be a serious proposal. I think there are other proposals out there, which I will not name right now, yep. which I do not <laughs> think are serious. Right. I don't think that they have any chance. Um, I would not put many worlds in that basket. Gotcha. Okay. Um, but if we, if we take off the table having the wave function be both complete and always Schrodinger, then your options are, all right, if it's not complete, then there's something else in the world beside the wave function. And then immediately you, you ask, okay, what is it? <laughs> and what does it do? And, and why am I talking about wave functions anyway? And things like that. Those are the natural questions. You ought to have answers at your fingertips. Or if you say, um, well, I think something went wrong with the Schrodinger evolution, then you can say, well, I think the wave function doesn't always evolve in this way. It does this other thing that people call collapsing, right, or reducing that looks very, very, very un-Schrodinger-like. This was the way that when John von Neumann wrote down his understanding of the mathematical foundations of the theory had two processes for the wave function, yeah. um, the Schrodinger process and a collapse process. And that's also kind of okay at a very high level, but if you, as soon as you say that, you also now inherit an obligation to tell me, all right, well, when and how does it deviate from Schrodinger evolution? And you, there are lots of details that can be put in in different ways and different suggestions. Um, some people think early on that the collapses had to be triggered by something. Mm -hmm. So things would go nice Schrodinger wise until X. What's the X? Oh, until a measurement is made or until right. an observation is made. And then that, of course, astonished. This is something Einstein was very upset about. <laughs> um, other people are upset about because they say, look, it's what do you mean an, an observation? I mean, who can do the observing? You know, can a mouse observe? Can, a, can a, an amoeba yeah. observe? Can they you know, trigger a collapse of the wave function. If you go that direction in a certain way, you end up with Wigner who says, oh, we have to talk about consciousness, consciousness. and now you're in the mind-body problem and, you know, you're in a mess. Um, other people have said, well, no, there's a kind of trigger or something that affects collapse, but it's not measurement or observation. It's like, say, gravity. I mean, this is something that Roger Penrose has been advocating for a long time, not with as much precision as a theory as some other things, but that somehow gravity, which is the one thing that is not well understood quantum mechanically, may come in here as triggering uh, um, this non-Schrodinger evolution. And then there's another idea, which is that, no, it collapses and nothing triggers it. It just, <laughs> it just happens. It happens randomly from time to time at a certain rate in a certain way, this is called the spontaneous collapse theories. Um, and there's a famous theory by Girardi, Romini, and Weber, the GRW theory, and they just put numbers to it. I mean, this was the great thing they did. They didn't just wave their hands. Yeah. They said, okay, yeah, it collapses every now and then. How often? Well, once every, you know, 10 to the 15 seconds per particle, you know, and uh, and how does it collapse? Well, there you multiply by a Gaussian of this width and, you know, put some math to it. 
Um, this was what this is what John Bell was so impressed by. I know when I talked to him uh, about that theory was that okay, for many years people have had this kind of general thought, but they took the step of turning it into clean mathematics. Yeah, and and also clean mathematics, but a real theory physically, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, not just an idea, yes, not right. just a general suggestion. That's right, <laughs> and it can be in fact experimentally tested. Yes, it does. It makes because the wave function evolution is different. And because the predictions really depend on what the wave function does, it will make, it's easy to see in principle, it makes different predictions. It's harder to come up with the experimental situations where you can see those differences. Although people have been working at it for some decades and making progress. The progress is mostly ruling out the theory. I mean, so far, yeah. we have not seen a signature <laughs> that the theory is correct, okay? We haven't ruled it out, but, but you could have ruled it in. If you'd seen certain things, you could have really ruled it in. It has not been ruled in. And ruling it in, these, these spontaneous collapse theories would count as falsifying these that, other That's theories. right. If, if that were to happen, then the other things on the table that we might talk about, including Everett, would, would you know, a, a lot of the motivation for Everett would go away because one of the motivations is, but gee, this Schrodinger evolution is so nice, yeah. right? <laughs> so that is a motivation. I guess the, to a physicist, the, there's an, a sort of, I don't want to say intuitive, but emotional objection to these spontaneous collapse theories. Like it just looks so ad hoc that the wave function just does this. And I guess you could say, yeah, but we're fitting the data. Yeah. And, and ad hoc, I, it's not that I don't have some sympathy, but when you realize how difficult these questions are and the weird extremes that people have gone to say, oh, but I don't like this one because it's ad hoc, that is such weak tea, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, get over it, you know? I mean, it, 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 the, 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 you know, the physical world might look a little more ad hoc than you'd prefer. Uh, you really shouldn't rule things out in a strong way for that reason. I, mean, I guess maybe following what you said about uh, Einstein and EPR, the one thing that you can say about quantum mechanics is that someone's going to have to give up on something that they really want to be true. Yes, I think that's... Correct. Um, I mean, some, yes, some, <laughs> I'm not sure. I, I would say, and, and now I'm going to, you know, tip the hand, which you'd understand already. If you already know, I'm not that sympathetic to the many worlds because of the problems I see there. And, and I also have this feeling that I can only say by saying the collapses don't smell right to me, right? Mm -hmm. I don't want to put too much weight on that, but that's just the way I feel. I mean, when you're in this, you kind of, make a judgment about what looks more plausible to you. Then we have the last possibility where, okay, yeah, there are no collapses. I agree. I like the Schrodinger evolution. It looks, it's clean. It's pretty. It's linear. Uh, I want to keep that, but I want my cats to just, one cat goes in and one cat comes out. Um, that means I have to have something in addition to the wave function. And now the question is what? Uh, and the amazing thing, and I think anybody, whatever you think about the theory is at least just for the non-relativistic theory, there's some complications further on. For the non-relativistic theory, this thought occurred immediately in 1926 already by Louis de Broglie. And you say, what is this magical thing you're going to add to your physics? Answer, particles, point particles. Just the sort of thing you were already familiar with, the sort of thing um, even Democritus well, his were a little <laughs> thick, right? They had their shapes. Yeah, uh, okay. These can be point particles, so they're even slimmed down and more minimalistic than Democritian particles. But the idea, okay, there are some particles and they move around and they constitute cats and tables and chairs. And if you want to know whether your cat's alive or dead, tell me where it's, what its particles are doing and I'll give you a good idea, right? Um, you might say that's such a simple idea. It couldn't possibly be the case that you just add some particles and write down a pretty simple looking equation for how they move and everything comes out right. But amazingly, in the non-relativistic theory, it does. Uh, I don't really see that as giving up on anything. I mean, because the, the, what you have to give up on is the completeness of the wave function, but it's not clear what the motivation for believing that ever was, except Bohr and so on saying, look, we know what to do with the wave function. If it's complete, then we're done. <laughs> <laughs> and we we want to be done, so yeah. don't tell us there's something else, right? <laughs> so, the, so in other words, the basic idea is when we invented quantum mechanics, we started saying, oh, electrons are like waves, right? They 
They have interference patterns under the right circumstances. They spread out in the atom. Um, they are also like particles in certain ways. We, we measure little dots on screens. And the brilliant breakthrough from De Broglie is that's because they're both at the same time. Yeah, or, or to put it as, as, as Bell, again, I'm always quoting John Bell. He says people were, as it were, you know, breaking their heads all the time, wave or particle, wave or particle. You'd hear wavical, right? It's a new concept you yeah. don't have. And he said, why didn't it occur to them the simple answer, wave and particle? Right. There, there is a wave. That is a thing that obeys a wave equation, which is why you get interference. That's the wave function or the quantum state, the thing described by the wave function. And in addition, there is a particle which always has a location. So if you ask, but why do these little individual spots form on my screen? It's because that's where the particle hit. Um, no reason why you can't explain the wave-like behavior because there is a wave and the particle-like behavior because there is a particle. And that, and their dynamics is coupled in a way that the particles are guided by a wave-like thing. And so the interference in the wave will affect where the particles go. So this table in front of us is in some legitimate sense made of particles. Yep. And the positions of those particles are, among other things, being guided by the wave function. Yes. Are they separately interacting with each other, the particles? Well, of course, the word interaction here is one of those words that um, different physical theories will give you different accounts of what even counts as an interaction. Um, certainly, the particles can be in a situation where what happens to one will make a difference to what happens to others, right? So the theory will just tell you, um, gee, if you, you turn on a, a magnetic field over here and now this particle gets deflected down. And by the way, that particle, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, will get deflected up. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, uh, the, the example I just gave you is a little bit misleading. But now, is that an interaction between the particles? Well, it's certainly mediated by the wave function, right? The particles can't do anything to each other. But in a way, already you have that in Newton. You say, well, how does one particle affect another gravitationally? Well, not sort of directly, but you need a, a gravitational field or something like that. There's a mediator. There's a physical mediator that accounts for these relations between what they do. Um, is that interaction, it's, it, it is, but it's not quite like classical Newtonian interaction. Um, one way to talk about this, people get a little bit, maybe this will help or maybe not, but let me say it briefly. If you've studied any physics, if you did any Newtonian physics, you'll remember that the fundamental equation is F equals MA, where A is the acceleration. And the acceleration is, is, is the change in the velocity, and the velocity is already the change in the position. So it's a second time derivative. And what that means for Newton is that to give you the initial conditions of a system, I both have to tell you where everything is and what its momentum is, right? So I need mm -hmm. both position and momentum. And then the fundamental kind of physical interaction through F equals MA is changing the momentum, yeah? Mm -hmm. But in this theory, it's not like that. Um, it's a first order theory. Everything is just done with one time derivative. So the initial condition only has to be the positions. And then what the wave function does is guide the particles. It doesn't push them around in, in, by producing Newtonian forces on them. It guides them. It, it, as it were, determines where they go. More in the way, this is a, a kind of analogy that... Uh, that David Bohm used to use, as if you were piloting by radio control a little boat out on the lake. And you say, yeah, you, as you turn the dial, you're, as it were, sending information or telling the boat where to go, but you're not pushing the boat around, right? And in fact, if, if, if the boat goes twice as far away, so your radio signal is half as strong, still, as long yeah. as it's getting the signal, it's going <laughs> to guide it the same way, right? Whereas a Newtonian force, you'd sort of think, well, the further away you get, the weaker the force has to become. So it's a different fundamental picture of physical interaction. And I think many physicists object to it or, or you know, have this intuitive uh, emotional response to it because the wave function is guiding the particles, but the particles don't influence the wave function at all. Right. And maybe part of that negative feeling is that they're still thinking of the wave function as a Newtonian force field. They, they might be thinking that. This is an objection people have raised quite explicitly 
that this theory violates, they call the generalized Newton's third law of action and reaction, right? So they say, oh, well, in general, I think if A has an influence on B, B should have a back influence or a reciprocal influence back on A. And that, I have to say, strikes me as just silly. Um, <laughs> I mean, in a certain way, if you, you say to Newton, look, doesn't the law of gravity somehow affect what particles do? He'd say, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you say, but what about the particles? Do they affect the law of gravity? He'd say, no, of course not, right? The law of gravity doesn't change because of what the particles do. Um, the, what the way the particles behave do, is is accounted for, as it were, by the, by the law. So we don't usually think that if A affects B, B has to have a reciprocal back effect on A. Um, lots of cases where even in physics, we wouldn't say that at all. So this seems to me to be a bit special pleading of trying to find something to complain about. <laughs> I mean, certainly it sounds like a very made up metaphysical principle that they, that they <laughs> yeah. just made up. Okay. You mentioned David Bohm. Tell us his role in this story. So it's an interesting, I mean, the, the, the history of this is very interesting because again, people were very concerned there was the early quantum theory by Bohr, which had this very classical looking idea of this planetary atom and then these jumping kind of jumps, which were unusual and they didn't quite understand. And then the new quantum theory was developed in the 20s, mid 20s. And the mathematics of it came out first matrix mechanics by Heisenberg and then wave mechanics by Schrodinger. I'm just throwing some names mm -hmm. out, but people have heard these names. Yeah. But they had the math in a way. They kind of knew how to manipulate the math to make some predictions. But it wasn't at all clear what the physical picture was, right? What's the physical theory here? And de Broglie early on looks at this and says, well, I can just, I can just put these particles in, these point particles, and have them guided around by this quite simple equation. The, you need a second equation because we needed an equation to tell us what the wave function does. And we're just going to keep Schrodinger's equation for that. So we got that. No, no real dispute about that. Then we need a second one, which tells me what the particles do. And that's going to be a thing called the guidance equation. And just from mathematical simplicity and other very basic physical considerations, I think I've seen claim 10 different ways that would lead you in in the non-relativistic theory to a very simple, obvious equation, guidance equation really guidance for this. Equation. So lots of ways to motivate it, you know, intuitively. And uh, so de Broglie discovers this and he presents it. He was very young at the time. And some rather bad objections were made to the theory, but de Broglie on his feet couldn't answer them. And the, the story seems to be that he was just a bit traumatized by the whole thing because these were the big shots of physics. I mean, he's a young guy. He's yeah. at the Solvay conference with the mm -hmm. biggest names. Einstein is there, Bohr is there and so on. And, you know, they're Pauli, whoever, they're beating up on him. And he, he just kind of seems to have abandoned the theory a bit. Uh, as far as I can tell, and I've heard people tell me this more recently who looked into it, um, it kind of lays fallow. Now, Einstein, who we know didn't like the Copenhagen understanding of quantum theory, we know played around with this theory or very similar theories in the intervening years. He didn't like it, but he didn't like it because it had what he called, in, in a very manifest, easy to see way, spooky action at a distance, this non-locality. So we know why he didn't like the theory. And he, he could never come up with a satisfactory version to him. Um, and then, but it's very possible that he came up with the version that other people think is satisfactory. Exactly, he could have he could have very well had it, and it sort of stayed that way. And then, and then the the really interesting situation, if we get into this, is David Bohm is now a, a young physicist, very very well regarded at Princeton. He writes a book explaining quantum theory from the kind of Copenhagen Borean point of view. And he's in Princeton. Einstein's over at the Institute for Advanced Study. And he's kind of saying, gosh, I, I would like to get my nerve to go ask Einstein what he thinks of my book, right? And he's actually trying to get other people to approach Einstein. <laughs> and as this is going on, he gets a message from Einstein. And Einstein says, I read your book. I, you know, would you like to come talk about it? And the story is he goes to talk to Einstein. So it's like 1950, 51, something yeah, like that. Yeah, 51, I think. Um, Einstein has read the book and he, Einstein says, I think this is the best, the clearest exposition of the Copenhagen approach that I've ever seen. I mean, he was really trying hard, but Einstein raised some objections. <laughs> and the story is, and I think it was 
Gell man who tells the story was Bohm's roommate at the time that, that Bohm goes, meets Einstein, comes back, and he reports when he comes back, I'm back to square one. <laughs> he was convinced by Einstein's objections. He just, yeah. he couldn't answer Einstein's objections. He realized that he really didn't understand what he himself had written. And within a year, he discovers this other thing, which was the same thing De Broglie had done, and apparently independently, as far as I can tell. I mean, I was told recently, I haven't done the research myself, but again, it's not hard to find that theory if you're looking in a certain well, direction. Right, right. And then he publishes these papers, this two-part paper in 1952, um, a theory that introduces so-called hidden variables into quantum mechanics and gives you all the right predictions. And this was something that people had believed had been proven mathematically impossible by John von Neumann um, when von Neumann wrote his book. Yeah. So this is, of course, a shock. It's like <laughs> you're not supposed to be able to do that. And then you look at the paper and you say, wait, um, it does look like you can do that. And we now understand that von Neumann had made not a mathematical mistake, but a kind of conceptual mistake, which was caught at the time. Um, by Greta Hermann. Greta Hermann, yeah. Um, and people pointed it out, but, you know, who's listening to Greta Hermann? Right. When, when Bohr and Heisenberg are saying yeah. the opposite. So yeah. in 52, the, the, the theory sort of gets reborn. It's, you know, under Bohm's name and, and Bohm worked on expanding it to cover spin and some other, I mean, you know, it's a kind of very basic theory at the beginning and then you start adding bells and whistles um, to cover mm -hmm. more and more phenomena. And... It might still have disappeared, but John Bell became a fan of it, right? Well, Bell, it, it's not that Bell started out as a fan of it. It, it. Bell was a fan of this. He was a fan of saying, I understand what this theory is claiming, right? There's no mystery about it. Yeah. There are these particles. There's this wave function. Here's what the wave function does. Here's what the particles do, okay? This is a picture of the world. Like it or lump it. Um, when I first learned about this theory, and I was very skeptical about it from Shelley Goldstein, Shelley helped me a lot at one point in our discussions because I was being very obstreperous. And he said, look, surely you'll admit this is a theory of something. <laughs> <laughs> OK, yeah. um, it says there are these particles. There's this other thing. Here's what they do. Now, just in your mind, imagine a world as this theory describes. Wouldn't it be interesting if that world looked very much like the world we live in? <laughs> Which turns out to be true. Right? This is always good advice when people have trouble thinking about new theories because they always want to fit it into their own boxes, yeah. right? Yeah. And if you just ask what it would be like if it were true, yeah. you make progress. Right, right. And it it solved, the, it addressed the problem that Einstein had raised about locality by saying, yeah. Yes, yeah, so this is what I was going to say. So, so Bell and Bell tells a wonderful story, right? Bell says when he first learned quantum mechanics, he was very puzzled by it. He didn't understand what was going on. And he thought you need to add something to it. You need these additional variables. The wave function is not the whole story. And he said he was told by his physics professors, no, 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 no. Von Neumann has proven it can't be done. Mathematically proven, you can't add any additional variables and keep the same predictions. And Bell says at the time he didn't know any German and the book had not been translated. And so that's where it sat. Um, he just didn't know why. He didn't understand. He couldn't read von Neumann's proof, but he was told there was a proof. And then Bell says he just gets up in 1952 and reads this paper that's been published and says, wait, Bohm has just done what everybody's telling me von Neumann proved couldn't be done. Something's gone wrong here. He quickly uh, uh, convinces himself that the mistake in that case was on von Neumann's side. But he sees that the theory has this manifest non-locality. And he asks himself, surely what Einstein must have been asking himself, can you get rid of it? Can I have a kind of theory like this, but without the non-locality in it that still makes the right predictions, yeah. the quantum mechanical predictions? That's the very precise thought that Bell had. And when he finally got some time off on sabbatical to sit down. Because he couldn't do it during his regular work. Yeah, no. <laughs> but, it's, but the amazing thing is, of course, when you see Bell's proof, it's a few lines of algebra. It's not like, you know, proving Fermat's last theorem. OK, it's not hard <laughs> mathematically. Um, when I first read about this stuff, which was in, in the Scientific American in, a, in an article by Bernard Despenia back in 79, I guess. 
it's not looking back on it. It's not the greatest article in the world, but it was enough was there that just with a little math, you could see, wait, <laughs> wait, I see the problem, right? Yeah. I really, this just stands out at you. Um, so I, the, the, what happens with Bell is Bell, what Bell realizes is, wait a minute. No, you can't get rid of the non-locality out of this theory. You can't get rid of the non-locality out of any theory. I mean, throw away quantum mechanics and start from scratch from entirely different principles. Bell's proof is not about quantum mechanics. It's just about certain experiments and the correlations that you see in the outcomes. You can't have a theory that is local in a well-defined sense that will predict that. Quantum mechanics does predict it. And more importantly than quantum mechanics predicting it, the world does it, right? That's why the Nobel Prize went to, went to Clauser and Aspe and Zeilinger recently for doing the experiments that showed that, viol that the violation of Bell's inequality actually occurs. And as you and I both complained about in separate occasions, the Nobel Committee blew it in their press release. <laughs> yes, they did. <laughs> They, they said that what they had done was what proved that von Neumann was right and you can't have hidden variables, which is just <laughs> the irony there is so delicious uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> because Bell became, you know, Bell then became the probably the strongest advocate of this Bohm, Bohm's theory or de Broglie's theory, which is a theory with additional variables. Why? Because he could say, well, what's the objection? You can't object as Einstein did. I don't like it because it's non-local because now I understand Okay, the non-locality is just in the world, right? Suck it up. Um, and it's a clear theory and so on. I mean, at one point, Bell says he's going through all these different ways of approaching quantum mechanics. And he says, well, the pilot wave approach uh, shows the best craftsmanship. But then he says, but is that, he says then wonderfully, I mean, he always made these cutting little remarks. Is that, is that uh, a virtue in our time? <laughs> <laughs> right. Do people appreciate good craftsmanship anymore? Or do they like just things that sound woo woo, you know, amazing and blow your mind? Because it is it at some level, it's a much more pedestrian kind of theory. You say, yeah, there's some particles, they move around. Yeah, there's this wave function. That's a kind of funny thing, but I'll explain how it you know, how it plays into the architecture here. It was a rough time for the philosophy of quantum mechanics uh, <laughs> in certain ways. But okay, so um the I think if there are any physicists out there who are not into the foundations of quantum mechanics and they're listening, they're they're very confused because one uses the word locality in different senses sometimes. I mean, if you asked a quantum field theorist, is their field theory local? They would say, yes, it's very, very local. So what exactly do you mean by this word? Good. So and and there is even a technical mathematical condition that's imposed in quantum field theory that they will call locality uh, has to do with commuting operators. Um, okay, so what's going on? Well, one thing to say is that there is, there's, Bell proved there has to be some kind of influence or effect. If Alice and Bob, if I set up a pair of particles in a special state called an entangled state, and anybody who's heard about this at least has heard the word entangled, um, but send the particles off way in different directions. So they're you know, hundreds of light years apart, you know, one into Alice's lab and one into Bob's lab. Um, the intuition of causal locality basically says nothing that Alice does can have any actual influence or effect on what Bob sees, right? Yep. That doesn't mean there can't be correlations between what they see. I mean, everybody knows, it, 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 people give this example, you tear, tear a dollar bill in half and send the two sides off in different directions. Of course, Alice seeing one half immediately informs you that Bob will see the other half. But that's not Alice doing anything that affects Bob at all. That's just it trivial, was always right? true. And everybody understood one. that. Everybody understands there could be correlations like that. But those correlations are already explained by what happened at the source. And so nothing non-local is going on in that case. Bell showed, no, you can't get the kinds of correlations you see in quantum mechanics by that kind of local story. There has to be a sense in which what Alice does actually makes a difference to what Bob sees or the other way around. That's causal non-locality. Now, the next question that arises is, oh, could you implement that in some way to allow Alice to send a message to Bob, right. signal Bob, right? Tell Bob whether they're going to meet for, you know, lunch today or not. And the really interesting, I mean, a very interesting thing is that at least under certain pretty clear idealizations, you can kind of look at 
the way quantum mechanics work and say, well, no, actually, even though you can't get rid of this connection, you also can't use it to signal. And, and the person who proved that first was also Bell. It's a, people like to call it the Nobel telephone theorem. So he was perfectly <laughs> aware of it, right? You can't use the non-locality to signal. Uh, and, and sorry, uh, that's, a, it, that's a feature in Copenhagen, Everett, Bohm, whatever you want. You, yeah. you never use well, it. Okay, now this is now I'm gonna now I'm gonna tread off into into treacherous territory. Good. That's why we're here. It's late. In the okay, um, if you say, and I think it's just a bad thing to say that the 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 fundamental postulate of say relativity has to do with signaling, that you can't signal faster than light, and you say, oh that, well, then this is still a local theory. But that just I I think. First of all, signaling isn't even the right kind of concept that should be in the foundations of any theory, just as measurement shouldn't and just as observation shouldn't. Um, and, and, you know, Bell proved there is this kind of non-local causation. And maybe I can't use it to signal, but so what? Um, but then the, the, the next thought is, gosh, if there really is this real physical non-local connection somehow, why can't I use it to signal? Yeah. I mean, you'd sort of offhand <laughs> think there must be some clever way to do it. Now, I'm going to report something. It, it, to ask that question, of course, you really need a well-defined theory on the table in front of you, right? Because you have to ask, well, what can I do with this physics? Um, quantum mechanics tends to use these things called Hermitian operators or or uh, as they call them observables and they sort of you the mathematics of that is is what they look into to ask certain questions but if you have an actual theory in front of you you're not restricted in that way you know you can just say well can i do something can i twiddle this and you know see something there it looks like in the bohmian theory with spin there's reasons to believe you could signal faster than light oh this could be you the most popular podcast you, ever. You, you weren't expecting that, <laughs> were you? I was not. It is, it is, the, I am, conv personally, I suspected there should be a way. Uh, Sidhant Das, who's a young researcher, has been looking at something which amazingly people had not looked carefully at, at which is in this pilot wave theory, when you add spin, Mm -hmm. Okay, that's an, an, an additional physical degree of freedom. People usually just don't fiddle with it. They kind of deal with spinless particles, <laughs> you know, at this level to understand things. When you add spin and when you look at there's a very specific thing you can look at that standard quantum mechanics doesn't have an obvious way to even treat. All right. This is the key to understanding this. That is arrival times. So if I if I. This is a, a well-known issue. Yes, it is a well-known issue, although people just kind of put it out of their mind. So if I have a, an, an electron, as it were, confined in a little box, which we kind of know how to do, and at some moment I open the box and then I've got a screen and at some time a flash appears on the screen, one thing you can ask is, well, what was the, what was the transit time? How long, what was the time gap between when I opened the box and when the flash occurred? And it turns out, if you ask quantum mechanically, and in quantum mechanics, you, of course, have to do experiments many, many times, and you get kind of statistical results. You get a, a, a distribution of results. It's nobody agrees how even to make that prediction using standard quantum mechanics, because there is no Hermitian operator that corresponds to arrival times. Okay. okay? Mm -hmm. in, the, in, in this pilot wave picture, because you have these particles and they just move, it's kind of easy, at least, to ask the question, according to the theory, how long did it, would it take a particle here to get there, <laughs> right? So you can actually do these calculations. And when you do them with spin, you start to see that there's a spin dependence of the arrival times, uh, which you really weren't expecting, but it shows up. And if that's right, it's already a question of whether you'll see that. This is something you could check in the lab. We're trying to find people who will do it. But you need <laughs> specialized equipment and you need the motivation to do it. If, if there is that spin dependence of the arrival times, then there's a very quick argument. Oh, you could signal. Now, the signaling would be very subtle. I mean, it's not like you could flip a switch and a light would go on there. But it would essentially say, if Alice orients a magnet in her lab in a certain way, Bob will suddenly start seeing a slightly different distribution of arrival times than if it's oriented another way. And 
that would be any kind of information, right? It doesn't have to be a clean, 100% strong signal, any signal, right? Any Shannon information. Sure. And this suggests that, yeah, you actually should be able to do that. Okay. Now, there are lots of still, there's lots of arguments within the community about whether this is right. How far do you have to carry the analysis uh, into the observing equipment? I mean, lots of stuff. Maybe in a couple of years, people will say, no, this argument breaks down for some reasons we don't quite understand yet. So I don't want to say this is nailed down, no, that's but okay. it's there yeah, and it's edge, a yeah. really hot, interesting, interesting topic and one that could be tested in a lab. Some yeah. of it you could do today. I'm not completely surprised because both you and I have written papers about energy conservation and its failure in quantum mechanics, which you know, anyone could have done in the 1950s. Yeah. They just didn't ask the question. But um, is this a fact that you're talking about now? Would it be a difference between Wellman mechanics and other formulations of quantum? Or it's is a, it just it, that you can't ask the question? Yeah, it's a little hard to say because – and again, I'm now just reporting what Sid Hunt tells me and he's done all the research. He says if you go into the standard physics literature about arrival times – you'll find 20 different suggestions yeah. about how to do it. They tend to agree with each other in the far field. That is, if there's a long time between when you release it and when you detect it, all of these different approaches converge on the same answers. But in the midfield, there are places where they will not converge. So what can you say? I mean, it, it, there's, it, it's not clear what predictions the, quote, standard approach even makes. Got it. So you could say if the if the pilot wave approach makes a clean prediction, it's clearly a different theory because, look, it's doing something precise where the rival doesn't even have anything precise to say. The other obvious question is you've been simultaneously talking about whether you can send a signal faster than the speed of light, but also working in the context of non-relativistic quantum mechanics yes. where there is no speed of light. So That's right. do we have to talk about relativistic quantum field theory to have this conversation? Well, we certainly don't have to talk about it to have the conversation we've had up until now. Because even before relativity, if you said, look, Alice is in a lab 100 billion billion miles away from Bob. Yeah. <laughs> um, can Alice do anything in her lab that, Bob, that would make a difference to what shows up in Bob's lab? You, you, the natural question. thought would be no. I mean, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, even if there were some effect, even if there were a fast effect, it would drop off with the square of the distance. It would, you know, tail off. There's, you know, so you can have the discussion about non-locality even in a non-relativistic. Now, it becomes sharper in a relativistic context because then you mean faster than light where there is a light cone structure. There's kind of an objective thing you mean there that's very sharp. So you can sharpen it up in the in the relativistic context. But I think you can still reasonably have it. It's not like all of your discussion of the non-relativistic case just falls to the floor when you notice there's relativity. My halfway informed feeling is that well, me mechanics looks quite natural in the non-relativistic regime. And it's a little bit more of a challenge to see how we should just do quantum field theory in that picture. Yeah, uh, there, there is no doubt there, there are both conceptual and technical challenges when you go from standard quantum mechanics where, and, and one of the signals here for people who don't know, is that in quantum mechanics, you talk about a system having N particles and that's it, right? Unless you add some or take some away, it's going to be N particles forever. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that's but not the world. <laughs> that, that's not the world. Um, it, it, we now know that there is some phenomenon that we call particle creation and annihilation, that particle numbers can change. And, and so you need to account for that. Um, whether, I mean, there are lots of subtleties here. One subtlety is the thing we call particle creation and annihilation, is it really? Um, and, and what I mean by that is when Dirac, and he's just a standard guy, was talking about this, he didn't have particles really come into existence. He, he said, well, there are always infinitely many particles filling up negative energy states. And what we call the creation of a new electron and a new anti-electron, a new positron, is really just lifting an electron that was there all along in a negative energy state up into a positive energy state and leaving a hole behind. And uh, the, the, you know, so it looks like there's a new electron and the hole is the thing we call the positron. Now, that's a story that would account for the phenomena without really creating any new particles. It's just moving them around in energy space, as it were. So there's certainly you have to account for the phenomenon, right? You have to account for the phenomenon. Yeah, I can take a, a, a really high energy photon 
and gee, they're just, you know, appears uh, uh, now an electron and a, and a positron or, you know, some things that, that satisfy certain conservation laws. We need to account for that phenomenon, whether it really deeply requires uh, new particles or do you want to give up the particle? The other thing to say is the pilot wave picture is not tied to particles. Um, it just says there's something that the wave function is guiding. It could be particles. It could be a more field-like thing, right? There's a kind of way of doing Bohmian field theory where you replace the particles with fields, but the same kind of architecture. And the other point to make, which at least needs to be made, is that people can say, gosh, but there's no good Bohmian quantum field theory. Standard quantum field theory has been plagued <laughs> by mathematical problems and, you know, uh, runaway singularities, numbers you try to calculate and they all come out infinity. It's not as if it's all, you know, conceptual lightness and clarity in the so-called standard picture. So you don't want to hold this picture to a higher standard sure. of, of mathematical precision and so on than you're allowing for the theory that you happen to use. Okay, that's that's perfectly fair. But I'm I'm just trying to get straight for the listeners out there. You know, if a, if I'm a particle physicist and I just calculated the rate of Higgs bosons decaying into two photons and something like that, yeah. is that stuff I can do just as well in the current Bohmian framework, there or are, is that work in progress? Okay, so the, one of the things that people have looked at is suppose I, I remain, and again, there are different moves you could make. You could say, I'm going to give up the particles altogether and put something else more field-like in. Uh, or you can say, no, I'm going to stick with the particles, but I am going to allow literally the number to change. I'm going to allow particle creation and annihilation. You can do that. That, how you would work that out in a kind of pilot wave picture was done, has been done for 30 years ago, I guess. And what you do is you say, in the original picture, you have a fixed number of particles and all they do is move around and change their configuration. But now I say, no, 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 the real space of possible states is there's a zero particle state and a one particle state and then two particle states and then three. So this whole um, yeah. thing called Fox space, which is familiar to any of the physicists you're talking about. And you say, no, that's that's what I'm now going to say. The thing is always in a particular location with a particular number of particles. Sometimes it just moves around in one of these sectors and the number doesn't change. And sometimes it can jump up or jump down, which corresponds to particle creation and annihilation. I now need a, a, a dynamics for that. It turns out that dynamics tends, instead of being deterministic to be indeterministic. The easiest way to do it is say that at any given time, there's a certain chance you'll jump up and create a new particle or jump down and lose particles. Okay, You can do that. And what falls out of doing that is the mathematics of standard quantum field theory. Okay. But so just, just so I didn't lose it, among people who are fans of Bohmian mechanics right now, it's there's a camp that thinks maybe the hidden variables are field-like, and there's another camp that thinks maybe there's just a collection there's, of particles yeah, that can still change particle their number. Right. So we're not sure. That's right. There's not a leading. And, and there's a lot of things that are debated within it. So here's another question. People, when you start out, you're always treating electrons and gluons as particles. but And they're all fermions, right? They're all half half. Well, the gluons are not. Scans. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Um, I meant quarks. Um then people ask, well, what about the photon? Yeah. Is, is that a particle? Are there photon trajectories? And it turns out you can try and develop a theory in which there are and a theory in which there aren't, <laughs> okay? And people work on both sides and mm -hmm. there's no agreement in the community. And you ask, well, what would be the advantages, you know, uh, of doing it this way? What would be the advantage of doing it this way? So it, it's a a general architecture of how to develop a theory that can be implemented, of course, in many different ways. And so even within the big house, right, yeah. the, the, there's rooms in the big mansion of people who are working in different directions. With regard to the idea of sort of stepping back from the fields and going particles as your ontology, two things come to mind, one of which is against that idea, one of which is for it. So which one do you want me to tell you first? And then you can respond. <laughs> which, <laughs> the worry me, I have yeah, is give me the bad news first. <laughs> something like the Higgs mechanism, 
where it seems that the Higgs boson lurking as a field with an expectation value throughout all of space is playing a crucially important role yeah. in explaining phenomenologically observable properties. Yeah. Is that something you could, you, you, I, I, I mean, I think I just answered that, which is it, it sounds like you're the kind of person who would say, uh, I'd rather, yeah, I'll treat my fermions as particles and I'll treat my bosons as fields, essentially. Which oh, is, okay. Yeah, I won't, I won't introduce particles associated with the integer spin objects. It, that that sure. I think would, would, would make you happy, right? I don't have to say there's a Higgs particle right. to, to work it into the theory. And, and there is a reason to think that you're going to work bosons and fermions in diff can enter into the theory in different roles. Okay, this is going to undo the good news that I had. So yeah. I don't know if you know this because I only recently learned it, but Richard Feynman, when he was inventing Feynman diagrams, part of his motivation was to get rid of quantum field theory and replace it with another theory of particles again. And we now think of Feynman diagrams as a tool for understanding quantum field theory. So he, he changed his mind. But yeah. his motivation, I'm told, was the cosmological constant problem. Really? Yeah. No, I did not know that. Yeah, I mean, I was told that I, I, you know, I need to find the, the reference for it. But the idea is if you have fields, they all have these zero-point energies and they add up to infinity or you cut it off and it's, it gives you a big vacuum energy. But if you have particles, you don't have that problem. So if I were a Bohmian particle ontology guy, I'd be claiming a solution to the cosmological constant. That's, that's, that'd be my <laughs> well, advice. That, that, I, I, look, that's a connection I was unaware of. My, my understanding, and again, this is not based in, in anything other than what I somehow picked up on the street, um, was that, that one way, anyway, let me put it this way, how Feynman thought about it, I'm not sure. One way to think about Feynman diagrams, which is, runs contrary to the way people often talk about them, is that they were just a mnemonic device, right? I, I have a mathematical equation that has an infinite number of terms that I need to sum up. And of course, the issue gets bad when that sum goes to infinity. But anyway, I have this, all these terms I need to add up. And that the, and that the diagrams were just easy ways to kind of remember what the different terms looked like, right? Um, to figure it, out what it, integral you had to do. Exactly. <laughs> and now if you the, 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 way, the way I say people don't do that is they often point at those things as if they are literal pictures of stuff going on. Oh, this is doing this and this is doing this and all the stuff is going on. And it's a booming, buzzing confusion of virtual particles that are running around. That talk, I don't think makes any sense on any view. I'm on your side. Um, yeah. So if, if it's just a mnemonic technique, then you're really, it's as if I like to say, suppose you wanted to calculate the volume of a sphere. And you just love cubes and you say, OK, look, I'm going to first of all figure out the biggest cube I can sit inside a sphere and calculate its volume. And now I've got these other little, you know, six round pieces sticking out. Now I'm going to find the biggest cube I can get out of each of those and then add those and then more cubes and more cubes and more cubes. And you can see, OK, there's going to be an infinite sequence of these volumes that you now need to add up to get the total volume of the sphere. But you'd say, but you shouldn't think that the sphere is this really complicated thing, right? It's actually <laughs> yeah. quite simple. And in fact, here's another way to do this calculation that is, you know, is straightforward and you don't do an infinite sum and in G. It's just, you know, four thirds pi r cubed. <laughs> no, I think that's actually an important point because... Lots of modern physics is motivated, uh, you know, beyond the standard model, particle physics searches for our next best theory is motivated by questions of naturalness, right, and fine tuning and so forth. And I think, I don't know what the right way to think about those problems is, but I think that not only do people talk as if there really are virtual particles popping in out of existence, which there aren't, uh, but they also think that somehow nature starts with a classical theory and then adds quantum corrections on top right. of it. And nature doesn't do that. Right. And, and that might change our perspective here. Right. And I think there's a, I think you're exactly right. And I think there's a methodological point here, which is that because we start out learning classical physics and it feels familiar to us and we're familiar with the math of it, there's this great temptation if someone says, oh, the way to come up with a good quantum theory is to start with a classical theory and then do this thing we call quantizing it, right? We put the hats on, we turn certain variables into operators. And well, most of the time it's clear how to do that. Sometimes it's not quite clear how to do that. But you think, but this doesn't make any sense, right? The, <laughs> the world, yes, the world behaves pretty well the way classical theory predicts at a certain scale. 
But that's because something emerging out of a very non-classical physics. And there's no reason to think that the right way into that physics is to start with the approximation and then twiddle with it, yeah. right? It's got to go the other way around, right? You need the fundamental physics and then hopefully you can understand why the, quant why the classical approximations work as well as they do. Um, but I think people are tempted, be, you know, because you have this kind of kind of algorithmic thing of, oh, just take a variable and put a hat on it and turn it into an operator. But conceptually, that's just not the right, the reality right way to think about that way. Yeah, yeah, reality that, that, doesn't that's work right. that way. So good. I'm glad we can find like all of our uh, points of agreement <laughs> against the consensus, despite the fact that we have some disagreements. But th this question of the speed of light, I'm going to go back to the experiment, the, the possible signaling, because... I, I do not know about that work. I don't know whether it's yeah, right. It's, so we're, it's that's fresh. okay. We're putting it on, yeah, right there. But the idea of looking hard for possible experiments to do, I think, is a crucially important one. I mean, my impression is that your typical Bohmian on the street thinks there's no experiment to do to test Bohm versus conventional quantum mechanics, whatever that is. Do you have a feeling about that? I, I, I do. And I, this is a discussion I am in right now arising out of this work. Um, that is, a lot of people in the Bohmian camp will kind of say, oh, but we know that it won't make different predictions than, quote, standard quantum mechanics. Now, I, I think that's just wrong. I think there are, you know, kind of toy cases that make it obviously wrong, but leave those aside. I, I, I just tried to understand what the argument was and I can't get it right. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think and I think some of this is defensive, right, because there's this and, and it, you stop back a second. And you see this is so unfair. You have standard quantum mechanics, whatever it is. Anyway, you can make lots of good predictions with it. Then somebody comes up with a new theory and then they say, oh, does your theory make any new predictions? If not, why should I pay any attention to it? Now, the first thing you notice is, but wait, if these two theories had been discovered in the opposite <laughs> order, right, the, you know, you would be going the other way around. So this can't be, from a logical point of view, a good objection that, you know, why should I take your theory seriously? Because it makes all the same predictions as my theory, because that's, <laughs> you know, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, right. But I think that is an objection that physicists often made. Very and often, so, yeah. you know, there were certain kind of defensive procedures that were put up to say, oh, no, we're not saying they're new predictions, right? Um, but, and then you'd have to go on. Um, I, yeah, I, my view is a sharp theory. Again, standard quantum mechanics has certain vaguenesses in it. Um, if you, if you have to talk about measurement, if you have to talk about observation, um, because those are vague terms. These are the objections that we had. And so you'd expect a sharp theory will certainly ought to differ um, in some ways. And, and you should be looking hard at where those differences might be. Is, so the un unfair question, what fraction of the Bohmians out there agree with you about that? <laughs> Is there I, a vibrant It's little... not an unfair question, but it's a sociological question, which I just can't answer. I don't know. Okay. I don't know. And, and there are, and even the, as it were, the Bohmian camp is divided into sub camps and uh, probably the statistics in the different ones are different. And probably my guess is, weirdly enough, it probably correlates with age. Oh, I think that's young, not weird at all. I think <laughs> younger people are more open to certain things than people who've been through a lot of battles. Um, but I but I really don't know. Where are these Bohmians of which you speak? Are they in philosophy departments or physics departments or Europe? Well, um, a lot of them. Yeah. So. There were a lot of students um, in Europe, and I'm, I'm sorry, this is going to be just a little hard for me. Um, Detlef Durr, who was at uh, the LMU in, in Munich, had always a dozen graduate students. Uh, unbelievable what he did that nobody else I know has ever done to promote young people and bring them into this. And he was mm -hmm. in a physics department. He was in, he was in the physics, he was in the math, de oh, math, physics, maybe. math department. Yeah. Um, and he was just the most wonderful, caring doctor, father, and looked after these students. He could not get many of them jobs in academia. A lot of them have gone into other, you know, industry, whatever. They, they did their work. Um, but there are a lot of young people who came through that program who know it who know the theory and work on it. Um, Sidhan Das, who I mentioned, was one of 
of, of Detlef's last students. Um, and some of his students, a uh, couple of them are in Tübingen in Germany, you know, so there are more of them in Europe who've come through LMU and through his influence. Then the other thing that's happened is a lot of physicists who realize they're interested in foundations notice that if you have uh, credentials as a philosopher, you can more literally more easily have an academic career in a philosophy department as a philosopher of physics than you can in the physics department Still as a true. physicist. Yes. So some of them have switched over. Um, also, Detlef Stu, I mean, Dustin Lazarevich, who's now in the Technion in Israel. Um, there, there are people who are around. And it's, it's more than there used to be. I mean, the total number is up. Um, what the effect of losing Detlef, because Detlef died uh, during covid I don't know. I mean, nobody right now is is doing what he was able to do. And we have to hope that some, you know, there was dedicated some... person with the right the right psychology and, and, and so on can can kind of take his place and help people along. Do you think we started by talking about uh, why you don't need to make the sales pitch to philosophers? They get it. Yeah. How deeply do they get it? How much has quantum mechanics changed what philosophers think about metaphysics? So this is an interesting question. Um, in philosophy, I would say there are three camps of people who do what goes under the name metaphysics. And I just gave this talk at Rutgers, yeah. the undergraduates, about metaphysics and science. Are metaphysics and science enemies or friends or what? <laughs> or the same uh, thing? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That was my that was my <laughs> conclusion at the end. So you jumped right to the end. Sorry. <laughs> uh, but no, there's an interesting history because it really there's a certain point where they're clearly, you know, the, the considered to be enemies. I mean, Carnap. And anyway, um, I would say that in, in metaphys metaphysicians, people who would self-identify as metaphysicians in philosophy now fall into kind of three camps. There's a camp that's sometimes called analytic metaphysics, which tends to be doing things which don't seem to care much about science. They're asking questions that don't, it's not obvious that any scientific theory would bear one way or the other on the question. Can you give us an example? Asking. Oh, are there, I mean, these are, this is not just going to be words. Are there universals or tropes? Okay. So this is the kind of thing that, that a philosopher of a certain kind will understand and they'll be <laughs> fighting with each other forever about very universals passionate. and tropes. And it's very hard if you say, well, we're, you know, did Newton believe in universal tropes? You'd say, well, no, Newton didn't care. I mean, you know, this is not, <laughs> it's just not an issue that, that is built into the guts of that theory in any obvious way. Um, then there are, so, then there's another camp that goes by the name scientific metaphysics for the reason of saying that what I think is obviously correct. Metaphysics is about describing what exists at the most general scales. And if you're interested in what exists in the physical world, you better pay attention to science. Not to say that the scientists can just answer those questions, but they do have relevant things to say, to offer. Um, but then that group kind of subdivides into two, the ones who then specialize, say, to do philosophy of physics. Now that really requires learning some math and some physics. And at a you know reasonably good scale, some people are, have full PhDs in physics, you know. But you certainly have to devote some time to just studying math and physics to do this in a kind of specialized way. And then there's another group of people who clearly acknowledge the relevance of the physics, but they're not experts. And so they like to listen to the experts and try and figure what Fair they enough. can yeah. draw out of it, right, without themselves delving so deeply into it. I would say that's how, that's how the landscape goes. And But do they talk to each other, these people? Are they to go to the same conferences? Um, I... Yeah, I mean, they're certainly, they do talk, well, they're, they're, they're in, in each other's presence. <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of specialized conferences. Words but, happen. But there, but, there, but there are conferences. I mean, I was just invited to be on a panel at the Metaphysics Society of America, and I'll tell you, the people in that society are not people you'll ever run, in, run into. And, 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 you know, they were doing a very different kind of metaphysics, but they, they were happy. I talked about what I do and the way I think about it, and they didn't throw bricks at me. It wasn't the way they thought about it. They were interested. You they know? were interested. I, yeah, they were interested, thing, right? and yeah. they appreciated having the conversation. And, I mean, philosophers tend to be pretty open to 
talking about weird stuff because that's more of us comes with the territory. <laughs> Whatever strikes them as weird, you still don't just reject it, right? <laughs> I guess what I'm what I'm getting at, and I, I'm, I'm not trying to presume the right answer because I honestly don't know, but to what extent can we imagine smoothing over the conceptual differences between thinking about physics and thinking about metaphysics? Like it, it really should be thinking about reality is what we're doing, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, we do, you know, I do need to mention here that, um, again, you can be a, interested in metaphysics and not be a physicalist. So you'd say, part of what I do really is not going to be informed by physics. If I'm a mathematical Platonist and I'm worried about mathematical reality and I say, that's just not part of physical reality. So I don't care how your physics comes out. Yeah. That's a fair, you know, that's yeah. a fair thing. So yes. not all of metaphysics has to be hostage, oh, sure. you know, or, 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 or all that interest. It depends on, you know, where you're, where you're focusing your attention. Yeah. Okay. Um, we actually, you know, Barry Lower was another uh, person we had on recently, and Barry, he, he said something, not on the podcast, sadly, but uh, in informal conversation that was even stronger than something I would say. And I think he was being humorous about it, but he said he remembers very vividly being struck the day he realized that most problems of philosophy could be cured or solved by statistical mechanics. <laughs> <laughs> And I think that he has a different view about you than that dude. So we're running yeah. out of time a little bit, but I wanted you to give a, to have a chance to give a little bit of your view of uh, the, the arrow of time and, and things like that, which is the other giant thing that people who care about uh, foundations of physics spend their time worrying about. Right. Um, so let me actually start with the last thing first and just get it, get it out in the open so people always are, are, ought to at least be aware of it. I would say it is it is kind of everybody has this idea there's space and it's kind of three dimensional, at least at large scales. Um, and if I if I talked about, say, the north south direction at a certain point, if I went on to say, by the way, space goes north to south, it doesn't go south to north. You'd look at me funny and you'd say, <laughs> what in the world are you talking about? Right. Um, the, the You know, the spatial thing, it just. It, it, there are two directions and they're oppositely directed, but space itself doesn't go more one way than the other. I don't even know what you mean. On the other hand, the person in the street, you say, you know, time goes from, from, from past to future. It doesn't go from future to past. They would again nod at you and say, yeah, you know, tell me something new. Um, <laughs> now, I happen to agree with that. That is, I think time is fundamentally different from space. Temporal structure is fundamentally different from spatial structure in that temporal structure does have a fundamental directionality to it and spatial structure doesn't. This turns out to be a very contentious view um, <laughs> among philosophers and physicists for funny reasons, I would say. I don't know that we have the time to go into, but it surely is the minority view. And it's a little bit viewed, just, just, to, just to clarify, it's a little bit different than there are physicists out there and philosophers who will question whether or not time exists or whether yeah. it's fundamental. But here we're talking about the direction, the of, direction time, of time, not time. time. Right. Yes, yeah. that's okay. right. That's right. There, there, it would be even harder to deny the existence of time altogether. Um, but certainly the directionality is, is hotly contested. I think time itself has a direction. Now, it, it is clearly the case that there are temporal, manifest temporal asymmetries on any view. Um, if you give me two pictures of somebody 10 years apart, usually I can look at them and figure, oh, this was the younger and this is the older, right? Because people tend to wrinkle up. In a sense. Now, I, that's not, I, you know, maybe they had, you know, cosmetic surgery. I, I, I could get that wrong, yeah. <laughs> you know, but there, there are certainly lots of, of very reliable temporal asymmetries. And those need an explanation. Simply saying time has a direction would not explain all by itself any of those observable temporal asymmetries or what people sometimes call arrows of time. So I think all of that is a perfectly good object of study, even if you believe, as I do, that one of the things you can, you can invoke is that time is itself directed, right? That doesn't give me these observable asymmetries like that, but but it, it might be part of the explanation. How does it help? Um, since, since people like David Albert and Barry and myself think that you don't need an intrinsic arrow if you just have an uh, initial condition that is doing all the work. Well, because a lot of the explanation, I mean, we can, we can do this in different levels, but let me do the first level. 
Um, what do I mean by explaining something? Well, often I think it's a kind of causal explanation. I talk about cause and effect. And now you say, okay, but what distinguishes cause and effect? Offhand, in many cases, causes precede the effects. I mean, if, if people often talk about running a movie backward or imagining that, which of course, you can literally run a movie backward, but then the the end sequence comes before the title <laughs> sequence, right? You still have a direction of time. Um, if you took that seriously as a movie of something in the normal direction, also all the causal structure would be reversed, right? What were causes would become effects. And therefore the structure of causal explanation would be different, right? Um, and so you have to get a bit deep and, and, and statistical mechanics does come into this here in a way that I, you know, we, we couldn't get on the table clearly yeah. in a short period of time where you not only have causal explanations where you say this particular precise physical state gives rise to this later one, but other kinds of statistical explanations where you say this kind of physical state, not, I haven't precisely, but I'm going to constrain it in certain ways. There's a class of various things. Gives rise to this kind of state. I mean, this is the sort of thing that you take a box of gas and you say, if you wait a while, it'll eventually relax to an equilibrium. And that, of course, shows a directionality to it because uh, from this initial state, you can say in five minutes, it'll be the equilibrium. If you look at the equilibrium state at a ge generic level, a kind of fuzzed out level, you couldn't say, oh, five minutes ago, it was in this non-equilibrium state. So there's kind of asymmetry there. And that's connected to certain asymmetries in, in statistical explanation, probabilistic explanation. It's very interesting and deep, hard topic. Um, a bit different than worrying about, say, relativity, which you might say is about space-time structure. Quantum mechanics is about material structure. Statistical explanation is about a kind of explanatory project and what goes into it and what succeeds as giving um, statistical explanations of things. But I do think that um, reversing the direction of time, you might have a very good, what you consider to be a very good statistical explanation of something as seen as it were in one direction of time. And if you look at the other direction, you say, wait, there's no explanation at all. The explanatory part went away. Um, all I can say is a massive coincidence <laughs> or else to be tele teleological and say the future is somehow, but you know, the future is somehow affecting the present. But I, I take it to be one of the great discoveries of the scientific revolution to get rid of that kind of teleology. Does your view that time has an intrinsic direction affect what we would call microphysics, the standard model of particle physics, for example, or could it? Um, sure, it could. I, I, I mean, I think that it, it, it plays into your fundamental picture of space-time structure. And, and of course, one needs an account of space-time structure to even begin to write down what you think of as laws of physics. Um, and I think there are very specific ways in which having a direction, well, certainly having a direction, well, let me just give you a very concrete thing one could say. Um, so, so suppose I have a kind of grid, like a street grid, and I have uh, uh, two points on it, and you ask me, okay, how many continuous paths are there that will take me from A to B? And typically the answer, if the grid goes on forever, it's infinitely many, because it can kind of go short way or around or far around, go way out and come back. Now, suppose I put some arrows on that grid, Right, so they're one-way streets. Now it's not at all clear that that this number will always be infinite. Now it might be quite tightly constrained. The directionality gives me a resource there that a lack of directionality doesn't have, and I think that's actually quite important uh, and and plays out in trying to understand the laws of physics. But it's much more complicated. It's much more complicated. But that's what you're thinking about these that's days. That's what I'm. That's fact. one of the things yeah. I'm thinking about. Okay. Very hard. I mean, I've been working on thinking about what space at time could be like if they were actually not continuous but discrete at fundamental scale. Um, I worked a long time and did six chapters just on space, and now I have to bring in time. <laughs> and the time part really has to have a direction. Just for it to work, it has to have a direction. And you have to understand how the directionality comes Sorry, into it. Sorry, when you say for it to work. For this, for this scheme I have to, scheme. to okay. be a kind of thing where you could do a plausible looking sort of physics with. Do you have a catchy name for your scheme? Uh, yeah, full discrete geometry. Full discrete geometry. Okay, good. And the time 
directedness has to be yeah, part of the story. It's fundamental too. in it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Well, we're looking forward to that. We'll, we'll, we'll be so a book at some point. Yeah, I know. You said I chapters. got really stuck. Yeah. I mean, so... well, I'm up on chapter eight now. I mean, the, the spatial part went real well. And then it was like, okay, part two, let's bring in time. And then you realize it's a tricky business. Is it there quantum we're talking or classical? This is all, this is all classical geometry. Yeah. But it, quantum field theory, there is a connection to quantum field theory, which I'll just state briefly. We talked about problems just in doing quantum field theory, just mathematical problems. One way that this kind of Bohmian or pilot wave approach for quantum field theory was done was done by Bell. It's called Bell type quantum field theory. And one thing he does is he puts it on a lattice. That is, mm. he doesn't do it in continuous space. He does it on a kind of discrete lattice. And you have these jumps from lattice points to lattice points. That turns out to be very important to, to have a structure where you can do the math in a clean way. Mm. Okay. Looking forward to the book coming out. We'll, we'll pre-advertise it here. So here's the last, I'm not even call it a question, thing to respond to. You, you, when we talk about quantum mechanics, and as we say, you had to give up something maybe that was you know, was hopeful or intuitive or whatever. And even in, in relativity, uh, it seems like maybe the world is a little bit different. Is there hope for fundamentally understanding why the world is this way? Like in retrospect, can you say, oh, yes, it had to be quantum mechanics or are we just stuck with it? Yeah, I, I think people like to say that why the quantum, you know, you'll get this thing. I, I think, oh, come, come on, just, you know, grow up. <laughs> no, I mean, the, 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 there's going to be foundations. There's going to be the and it, one of the really hard questions in this whole topic is the question, where do I stop digging? Right. Where is my spade turned? Where do I say, OK, I've hit a foundation here. It looks like this is a plausible place to stop. And all you can say is, yeah, this this is the way it is. Could it have been some other way? Yeah, it could have been some other way. It isn't. <laughs> this looks like a plausible place to stop. If you think if you're never going to be satisfied, OK, then you're never going to be satisfied. And th the problem is there are dangers in both directions, right? If you're too easily satisfied, you'll stop digging when in fact you could discover a lot of interesting structure lying underneath where you've stopped. Mm -hmm. But if you're too pigheaded, you're going to get to the <laughs> bottom and still be banging your head against it forever because there is nothing underneath it, right? So there's a, a kind of, you know, connoisseur's feel for where's a reasonable place to stop. But I don't think you're going to be stopped by some master principle that says it could only have been this way. I, how could you expect that? The world is kind of contingent. Well, that seems like a reasonable place to stop. So, Tim Wildman, thanks very much for being uh, on the Mindscape can, can podcast. I, can I actually, before you do that, because I'm here and, yes. and I'm have many voices, many ears than I ever kind of normally will have, and I'm going to just take advantage of Please. you and say um, one of the things I'm doing is trying to promote foundations of physics, and way I'm doing it is I've founded this thing called the John Bell Institute for the Foundations of Physics. And we are at the very moment, a kind of critical moment where we're trying to buy a physical place for us to live. And if anybody out there likes people who talk about this stuff and thinks <laughs> they should have a place to go where they can meet and talk to each other, we have a GoFundMe uh, or you could go to www.johnbellinstitute.org. If anybody would like to help us out in any way, it's our moment of need, and uh, we would appreciate it greatly. Good to be reminded of that. I will also mention that in the intro and put links on the web page. Thank and you. I, can, I can mention it because it's an audio podcast. Tim is wearing a very fetching John Bell Institute polo shirt right now, so that could be swag. I don't know. Is that a GoFundMe? You, no, no, this this. To get the shirt, you got to come to the place. Oh, yeah, they the come shirt, to the place. Only, to the, the, only, the only, the only, the only exception <laughs> to that are my parents, who are ninety-five, and I said you can have shirts without actually going. But this is this you can only wear the shirt if you've been there and you've seen this beautiful island in yep. Croatia and enjoyed it, and then you get a shirt. But it, it is it is actually an important thing. I'm glad you mentioned it because it's a reminder that. Ideas are great and conversations about them are great, but institutions also matter for getting these ideas out and, there. And this is the problem is this field is, a, is an academic orphan. Yeah. Right. Foundations of physics doesn't fit. I mean, it's kind of doesn't fit in physics departments and it doesn't really fit in philosophy departments. Tell and, me. and so, you know, if it's going to live, a place has to be made for it. All right. Let's look it up on the, on the Internet. So in that case, Tim Walden, <laughs> thanks very much for being on the Mindscape podcast. Thank you.